A video distributed by the International Olympic Committee, not enough to reassure the tennis world. The Women's Tennis Association suspending all tournaments in China until it's sure that double star Pang Shuai is safe and sound. This after the 35-year-old Pang's quickly deleted post on Chinese social media last month uh, denouncing uh, unwanted sex with a former vice premier. How far will the ripple effects go? We'll ask about that video where Pung has seen speaking uh, with uh, International Committee President Thomas Bach and the timing just two months before the lighting of the torch at the Beijing Games. How seriously should we take calls for a boycott? How high are the stakes for the host nation, China, currently at loggerheads with the West, closed to most for international travel and blamed by many for the COVID pandemic? How badly does Beijing need a soft power win? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the pressure that's building on the Olympics. And joining us from Coventry, Simon Chadwick, director of the Center for Eurasian Sport. Thank you for being with us. Uh, with us as well, business consultant Chun Yan Li. Your latest book, uh, Cyrano, yeah. Confucius and Me, A Chinese Woman in yeah, Paris. Right. In, published in French. Yeah, yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, I'm translating it into Chinese. Okay. Yeah. So that's coming up soon. Uh, I hope, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, also with us, France 24's uh, very own Charles Pellegrin. Have you unpacked your bags? I have. I've, our, I've been our, here for a month and a half now. All right. Our, our former Beijing correspondent, who's uh, just back in the office this week after a well-deserved break. That's right. G good to see you. The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, tennis stars have been applauding WTA chair Steve Simon and uh, what he called enduring serious doubts about the safety of Peng Shuai. Nicholas Rushworth has more. Concern about the well-being of former doubles number one Peng Shuai persists, so much so that the Women's Tennis Association's chief executive Steve Simon announced the organization was suspending competition in China. He tweeted that suspension was going ahead with the full support of the WTA Board of Directors. Peng's safety became a matter of international concern after she posted a message on social media early last month alleging that a top Chinese official, Zhang Gaoli, had sexually assaulted her. Zhang is a former vice premier. The tennis star was absent from public view for three weeks before appearing at an event in Beijing. On the 21st of November, in a video call with the IOC president, Thomas Bach, she said she was safe and well. But that has not been enough to convince the WTA. Among those backing its move is Billie Jean King, who said, I applaud Steve Simon and the WTA leadership for taking a strong stand on defending human rights in China and around the world. The WTA is on the right side of history in supporting our players. Neither Zhang, who retired in 2018, nor the Chinese government have commented on Peng's specific allegation of sexual assault. The topic has been blocked from direct discussion on China's internet. The WTA is taking Beijing to task. Steve Simon, in his suspension statement, said he was greatly concerned about the risk that all of our players and staff could face if we were to hold events in China in 2022. The decision comes as Beijing is preparing to host the Winter Olympics next February. Rights groups are calling for a boycott of the Games over China's human rights record. So, uh, Simon Chadwick, uh, how, mm, how big a, a decision is this? How much money does the WTA stand to lose? In terms of how big a decision it is, it, it is potentially huge. Uh, especially if ultimately what we get is a, a, a full athletic boycott of the Winter Olympics by um, not just the United States, but other Western nations. As regards money, this is a really interesting question. And, and, and I, I find um, the WTA's position especially interesting on this. And that's effectively because there's not going to be any women's tennis in China next year anyway, simply because the situation with the pandemic and the way that the scheduling is uh, means that simply there, there won't be any women's tennis in China next year under the auspices of the WTA. So 
in the short to medium term for, for the WTA itself, there are unlikely to be any particular ramifications. But I think crucially in all of this is, is unlike, say, basketball or professional football, um, tennis has not really taken off in China in the same way. And so the potential commercial costs for, for the WTA, I think, are probably far more outweighed than some of the commercial benefits that will come from having actually adopted this position that the WTA now has. Yeah, I was going to point to, to, to basketball because we saw a TIFF a few years back with the Houston Rockets uh, over human rights uh, uh, in China. Uh, you're saying that uh, here the sums are smaller. Nonetheless, were you surprised? Well, just to give you a, a, a sense of magnitude, uh, it's, it's thought that the, the NBA could have generated somewhere in the region of about $5 billion from, from, um, from China. Uh, if you look at the WTA, they've, they've obviously got the Shenzhen tournament, which was taken away from Shenzhen this year and, and has been staged in Mexico. But in terms of partners and sponsors, the WTA only has one Chinese sponsor. The NBA is much more interconnected and, and economically dependent upon uh, China. And what was very interesting, therefore, I think, was, was Daryl Morey, uh, the Daryl Morey episode when he posted about Hong Kong. Um, the reaction in China to that was much stronger. And I, I think what we saw from Adam Silver, the NBA commissioner, was him trying to plot a middle course. So in other words, trying to placate interests in the West while also trying to, to, to um, subdue the situation in China. Uh, whether he did not, that or not, I think, remains a moot point. But this, this was a very different approach to the WTA. For me, this is quite staggering to have gone from um, being alerted about the, the, the posting on social media to making a very public statement to now withdrawing from China for the foreseeable future. This is unprecedented. And it's a very bold, a very strong, um, very striking move that I think warrants um, further analysis and further discussion. As we will do, uh, just a thought also, uh, Simon, uh this tweet put out by tennis great Martina Navratilova now challenging the International Olympic Committee to respond, writing on Twitter, so far I can barely hear you. Uh, are we headed towards some kind of boycott? We live in, certainly in sport, we're living increasingly ideologically binary times. And what athletes and clubs and governing bodies, sponsors, event um, uh, event. Um, owners and so forth, is really a call. You're either with us or you're against us. And so where we're now heading is is really a challenge to the sponsors that are associated with women's tennis in China, to athletes that potentially will, will go to Beijing, to governments that are having to make these kinds of decisions that you know, essentially people are drawing the battle lines and saying, well, you're right, you either side with the US and its allies or you sign with China, side with China. Uh, if you do side with China and you send your athletes to um, uh, to Beijing, then you're going to be complicit with whatever it is that we think Beijing is doing. And that clearly will then have consequences, not just commercial consequences, but political consequences too. And of course, there's the, war, the wider moral argument that the, the world is currently having around, for example, gender rights. Yeah. Chinese foreign ministry reacting at its daily press briefing. Let's take a listen. We've already answered your 我也願意啊,再次重申,中方一貫堅決反對將體育運動政治化的行為。From uh, your experience, Xia Pelgang, how, how much uh, is this being discussed inside of China, the WTA pulling out first off, and, and your thoughts on that reaction? Well, um, this discussion about, about Peng Shuai's um, sexual assault and all that, all, all that's been censored uh, on, uh, on Chinese social media. And all the fallout that's, uh, that we've seen globally on uh, non-Chinese social media was not visible on the Chinese internet. Um, and when it comes to that response by, uh, by the Foreign Affairs by the Ministry spokesperson, that's very uh, common uh, and very sort of usual way of dealing with that kind of, of, of problem, uh, talking about any sort of uh, attempt uh, um, to, to bring in the, this, uh, this topic uh, uh, in this forum as being politicizing uh, sport. We shouldn't expect the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to ever 
really say anything about or express anything about this uh, particular uh, case. They will just keep uh, trying to push it aside, saying that this is um, the work of um, interfering foreign powers that are trying uh, to basically uh, put a stop to China's rise, to China's rise, and to uh, basically uh, blame uh, blame China. Uh, interfering foreign powers, but as you heard Simon Chadwick there mention, we're, we're we're living in a time where professional athletes are more and more speaking their minds and uh, talking about uh, the, talking about uh, political issues. Absolutely, and this is something that they'll have to uh, take into account uh, when the Olympic Games start in February in in Beijing, with potentially some of the athletes that are that will be taking part uh, that might be willing to express something about this particular case uh, about Peng Shui, considering how 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 huge a, a, an event it's been on 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 social media here. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how uh, the organizing committee and the Chinese authorities deal with anyone that tries to say anything about this. Uh, a uh, particular issue. Uh, likely that they'll say that uh, it's in the Olympic Charter to not um, express any political statements. But we've seen a big discussion about this uh, in the world of sports over the past few years with Colin Kaepernick and with uh, more and more people calling uh, for for athletes to be allowed to sort of express uh, their own views about, about, about these things. All right. Uh, we, we saw in this case it was uh, tennis stars that uh, started upping the pressure when uh, Pong... Uh, fell out of the public eye after uh, that initial post on, on social media. Uh, and it was nearly three weeks later that uh, those tennis stars started really voicing their concern. And after that unconvincing tweet by Pong at a dinner with her coach on November 21st, the International Olympic Committee releasing, I said a video at the outset, it wasn't a video, it was a single still from a video chat uh, between the tennis star and the IOC president, uh, Thomas Bach, you can see her there uh, in those pictures, uh, 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 Chunyan, with uh, uh, her stuffed animals behind her. Yeah. Uh, and, and that didn't that did more harm than good in the West because people were like, well, why don't we see more of her? Why is this in this controlled environment? Uh, what was your yeah. reaction to the reaction? Okay, firstly, um, IOC has already uh, two video course with Peng Shui. So the last one was yesterday. And um, I always say said they also had the, the same concerns about Peng Shui. And uh, they ensured again that Peng Shui is going well. And they agreed to meet with each other in January. Between Have a I, dinner. Uh, dinner. I don't know, dinner or, or meal. And I want to highlight one thing in that I have seen uh, so many reports, news about Peng Shui. I agree that we should condemn all kind of sexual assaults, whatever the country. And we should also protect women's rights. But before uh, accusing somebody of sexual assaults, we need to do the fact checking. So what I observed, this is very important for me, is that many people haven't read the initial post published by Peng, Peng Shui on, on Weibo. So I have the Chinese uh, version here. If you type Peng Shui Weibo post in Chinese on Google and then click on image, you will find that. There is an English translation on the website of rated.com and a French translation of this post by La Libération, but the French com uh, translation is not uh, exact. Uh, there are a couple words which uh, have been exaggerated or, or uh, badly translated. Well, this post, uh, there are three parts. First of all, Peng Shui told how the story began. So she, uh, she described that, uh, you know, ten, ten, 10 years ago, she had a one night stand with Zhang. Then three years ago, Zhang retired and contacted with her again. She described she had much psychological uh, pressure and she was anxious, uh, she was afraid. Uh, and uh, uh, Zhang, uh, you know, tried to convince her all that afternoon, but at the end she agreed. And she wrote, she wrote herself that I agreed with the, the affection that I had for you seven years ago. And since that day, I renewed my love for you. So that's the first point. Second part, she described her um, extramarital uh, relationship with John, how they participated in, in, in many activities, how they exchanged opinions on many topics for um, a long time. And then she described the third part, they broke up. She published her post because John refused to see her again and 
she didn't get the official status in this relationship, and the wife of Chang was quite unfriendly with her. That, that's so, all. The, so there are two questions that everybody's asking, which is, A, why did she post this? Yeah, I, I will answer and that. And B, yeah. why was it taken down? Yeah, so I, I will answer that. Okay. okay. Before 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 answer in that, uh, I just want to note one sentence, which is very important for me, uh, which is in the post of Peng Shuai, uh, is that... You said there were no transactions between us. Yes, that is true. Our affection towards each other had nothing to do with money or power. She you know that? Okay. So, uh, for me, it's not uh, uh, allocation, allocation of sexual assaults. And this reflects the differences, I mean, intercultural differences in how we end a relationship between China and between the West. And the, I think that's one of the reasons why we have so many but uh, some things are universal Chun Yan. when yeah, you're well, talking about a young woman with yeah. a man who's the vice premier of the country th yeah. there's a mismatch in terms of yeah in that of course of course I, I i think firstly there is a language barrier secondly the post of Peng Shui can create some confusion i agree with that because you know we can see she was there, there is a feeling between love and resentment, disappointment, bitterness. She, she was in a breakup, relationship breakup. So this is the first point. I, I, I just let you all to read that. I don't, I, I let you make your opinions because right. this is and a fact. And, we're not, and, okay. and I agree with you, we're not there. Okay. But, but, the, but the question again is okay. why was the post yeah. put up? Why did she post okay. it and why did she okay. take it down? Okay. I'm not defending, defending the decision. I try to analyze the reasons. Sure. Okay. First of all, I don't know if it was her or the or, or someone else who removed that. I don't know. Secondly, I think, in my opinion, is that the government wants to deal with this issue discreetly, because we have several months before the Winter Olymp um, Olympic Games uh, in Beijing. My opinion, I'm not defending that, and I also agree that on the Chinese side, they can commun communicate better on that. Is that they can communicate that in a more direct and more transparent way. But before acquiring, I mean, before acquiring all of that, I think we should do the basic fact checking. Just, just why, did, why did she post this? Why did she post this? Because she was upset. I mean, she knew she would have, yeah. uh, she, she, yeah, let me this explain, would draw yeah, attention. Let's, let's be, let me explain one culture. It was a difference. risky yeah, move, right? Yeah, differ, dif um, difference in, in the culture. From time to time on, on Weibo, on a, a Chinese social media, uh, you, you can have some women, uh, mistresses, uh, some married men who posted uh, you know, messages they wanted to accuse the, 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 the our ex-lovers of uh, moral problems. Often, not, not all, the, all the time, but this happens from time to time. And they want the people to accuse the person because the ex, extramarital uh, relationships and the mistri uh, mistresses also are very, uh, and also the, the, the men which are unfaithful to their wives are very badly perceived in China. So this is some kind of difference. I mean, in, in France, we, we, this doesn't really happen very, very often. You it know? happens, but not often. Not, not all that. Right. Yeah. Sh Charles Pellegrin, your, your thoughts on that initial post? Well, um, there's a, it's, it's clearly, as, as uh, you were saying, there's a, um, it's subject to interpretation. The translation, there are yeah. different, different, different yeah. translations uh, of, of this uh, particular post. But that's not really the issue here. The issue here is that now there's, we're having this conversation. We're not the ones that should be having this conversation. This conversation should be spearheaded by Peng Shui herself. And she's not able to do that nowadays, today. And that we don't know why she's not allowed. We, there's no, absolutely no transparency about what happened after okay. that post was taken down. And that is the, the result and the fruit of this uh, particular way of doing things by the Chinese government. Okay. And, whether it's a cultural difference, whether there was abuse or not, now we will never know. Okay. It's not going to happen. Yeah, let me answer that. Is that I think um, if you really want to fix this problem or this issue with China, I don't think the way or the tone of Steve Simon will really work. Because if we accuse, you know, we say, okay, Peng Shui accuse um, a political man of sexual assault or of rape, and then you have a tone, very brutal, and 
aggressive. How do you want China accept that? I don't think. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, or, I will always pro promote the dialogue, the mutual understanding. If you want to fix the problem, don't use that way. Uh, from from uh, um, um, in terms of communication efficiency. And then if you want to accuse somebody, you, you check the fact. And then uh, I know Peng Shui appeared twice, you know, uh, in, in, the, in a video call with, um, uh, with uh, the president of uh, IOC. Uh, and uh, I, I can understand some people still doubt about that. But how do you want China to prove that China, uh, Peng Shui is alive or safe? How do you want? Put a camera? Allow his... foreign media to get in touch with her, which they've tried and have not been able to. So far, the whole narrative has been controlled by chi Chinese state yeah. media. But, but, let me bring in. Let me bring in. Let me bring in Simon Chadwick on this. Uh, uh, Simon, uh, picking up on what Chun Yan just said, uh, the, there was uh, that second call between the IOC president Thomas Bach uh, and uh, Peng Shui. Uh, and they put out a statement, the IOC, saying, quote, we're using quiet diplomacy, which given the circumstances and based on the experience of governments and other organizations, is indicated to be the most promising way to proceed effectively in such humanitarian matters. How do you interpret that statement? What I find really interesting about the IOC's involvement in this episode is that the IOC has spent the the best part of a year telling us that it's not a political organization and it doesn't get involved in politics. And yet here it is now deeply involved in politics. And, and I think the IOC senses the apocalyptic scenario, which is yet another disrupted Olympic Games. You've got to keep in mind that the IOC uh, obviously had disrupted Games 2020, 2021. So that's what the IOC, I think, is doing. And I use the word I uh, the words I think because for me, this entire episode is about um, failures in government and governance because we we really don't know. Did, did Pong Shui really write that message? Did she really post it? Did she really take it down? What is the Chinese government's role in this? How are they pulling the strings? But at the same time, why did the WTA respond in this way? They, they really haven't explained why they've been so strident when, for example, the NBA was much less uh, assertive in its relationship with China. At the same time, why did Thomas Bach feel, feel it essential to talk to Peng Shui and, and, and not so we could see this live on air, but through a series of photographs? And I think at this particular moment in time, because governance is opaque, not just in China, but I think across this whole piece, you know, we're really left asking questions rather than getting any answers. And so it's not just for Peng Shui and the Chinese government to explain themselves. I also want the IOC to explain itself. And I also want the WTA to explain itself as well. Can, can I just answer that? OK, uh, if you have read the full post of Peng Shui, for me, the response of Peng Shui to WTA is consistent with her initial post. And nothing has proved this doesn't come from her. OK, so um, and, uh, and uh, secondly, I think the international reaction has really exceeded Peng Shui's expectations. She should face much pressure for the time being. Because you Im imagine that if there are, we cancel you know, tennis tournaments in the coming years in China, if we boycott the, the Winter Olympic Games in Beijing, sh she shouldn't uh, want to say that. So she said in the first call with uh, uh, IC, um, IOC, that she wanted people to respect her personal uh, life, private life. I think she wants to, she doesn't want to talk about that uh, a lot. I think but that's you, my you, feeling. You, you take Simon Chadwick's point that uh, people don't trust the Chinese government, but they also don't trust the International Olympic Committee, which has a lot riding on the Winter Games going well. No, no there's no reason that, I mean, I, I always say, uh, I mean, you, you know, they said, I always said, they, had, they have the same concern. And what's the Olympics uh, spirit for me? I mean, the spirit of sport, Olympic Games, is that bring people together, people of different races, different countries, different cultures, and to promote the dialogue and to you know, reduce the conflicts or the escalation of tensions and conflicts. That's for me the spirit of Olympic Games. Yeah. All right. And then can I, can I, sorry, can I just come back in here? Sure. Um, 
Um, two things that I'd like to say. Firstly, in response to that, uh, if dialogue, if we believe dialogue is important, and, and your guests have talked about dialogue, then we really need Peng Shui, and we need the WTA, and we need the IOC. For that matter, we need the American government and the Chinese governments to tell us what their roles are in this episode and what they're doing. So that's the first thing. But just to give you one example of, of how opaque things are, um, the WTA has one Chinese sponsor, Aichi, which is a di digital platform. It's had this relationship since 2015. Since 2015, Aichi has been accused several times that it is complicit with the Chinese government and it has, it has been suppressing Me Too posts on its digital platform. Now, during that period, um, the, the, the WTA said and did nothing. So it's extremely unusual that right now the WTA chooses to take a stand on this one particular well, episode. Well, again, is that part of the power of athletes that they didn't used to have and uh, current athletes, but also the likes of uh, former greats like Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova who have been very vocal on this issue? I think things have changed, certainly over the last three or four years. And, and we talked about Colin Kaepernick earlier. But what I find, what the, the point that I'm trying to make is, is we simply don't know why the WTA chose to call this particular episode. When in previous times, over the last year, two years, three years, it had, had the chance to do that. And as I say, I re repeat again, this is about the opaqueness of governance and government, not just state authorities, but also authorities within sport. And I think that it's incumbent upon organizations like the WTA, like the IOC, and keeping in mind, I'm a sport academic, I'm not a geopolitician. You know, I really want to know from them why, they, why they're making these, these decisions. If Thomas Bach really does care and, and is trying to deal with this sensitively, then why, do, or why is it that all we have is a series of photographs of him meeting Peng Shui? I think you know, we need a little more from these well, organizations. His argument was we're using quiet diplomacy and that's more effective yeah i, I think I, I think he he well knows that te the temperature of the global debate right now and and he he needs to to be a little more yeah, convinced let, than he has been let's talk about the, the 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 global temperature uh this isn't happening in a vacuum and on november 22nd the french embassy in beijing by the way france hosting the next summer olympics so uh, a country that's got something at stake here uh, their embassy in Beijing publishing a statement on Weibo, that's the Chinese social media, expressing concern over the lack of information on Peng Shui, uh, saying we call on the Chinese uh, government to apply its commitment in the struggle against violence towards women. And specifically, it's 2016 People's Republic of China law against uh, domestic violence. Uh, let's get another reaction. Germany's incoming uh, foreign minister. Uh, telling daily newspaper Tageszeitung Wednesday that an eventual boycott is something to be considered. Annalena Baerbach, who's co-leader of the Green Party, talking of the link between business and human rights. Eloquent silence is not a form of diplomacy in the long run, even if some have seen it that way in recent years. Simon Chadwick, again, are the, t the times they are a changing when it comes to uh, human rights and business interests? Uh, certainly, we 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 know that that, that times are changing. We've, we've mentioned Colin Kaepernick, Louis, Lewis Hamilton, Naomi Osaka. We could we could name a whole a whole bunch of other people. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the WTA is is that they are on relatively safe territory because I think unlike some issues like, for instance, Hong Kong, and we go back to the NBA Daryl Morey case, which was about Hong Kong, uh, there are very few people in the world who are going to disagree that that um, women shouldn't be afforded exactly the same rights as, as males and that matters of sexual coercion or indiscretion or um, the excessive use of, of, of patriarchal power, you know, the whole world would frown upon that right now. So the WTA is, is on safe territory. But I think that is just symptomatic of, as, of, of, of I think, what I did refer to earlier as, as this kind of ideologically binary times that we live in, whereby we have the liberal West and the values that, that people like us hold dear, and then at the same time, you have the uh, the, the authoritarian, you know, in broad terms, East, which has a very different view of how life should be. And we've already referred several times to this kind of quiet diplomacy and dealing with matters privately in China. And I think that that kind of juxtaposition of different value systems, different cultures, different norms is 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 
really forcing people to to draw red lines. And and what what's happening is sponsors are finding finding themselves stuck in the middle. Uh, if we look at Pong's uh, apparel provider, Adidas. Um, you know, Adidas makes great play on its website, for instance, or, or of the need for gender equality and, and, and to treat um, the, the female community with respect. At the same time, Adidas is operating in China. It's it's one of its biggest markets, uh, intensely competitive. Adidas did suffer earlier in the year when it announced that it was no longer going to source cotton from Xinjiang province. And so Adidas is now stuck in the middle of this ideologically uh, charged situation knowing that it's spent millions of dollars to, to associate with the Olympic Games and at the same time knowing it will have to activate that sponsorship deal. But how you call it is incredibly difficult. If you call for the West, then you disaffect the, the, the community in China. As I say, incredibly lucrative market for Adidas. If you call for China, then the West will accuse you of complicity and, and you know, potentially there could be consumer boycotts there. And so these are incredibly difficult times for these sponsors. And I think if we're really looking uh, uh, for for a, 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 an accurate barometer or an accurate test of which way the geopolitical winds are blowing, it's when that first sponsor says, "Well, actually, we're going to call it with the United States," or alternatively, "No, we're not going to we're not going to pull out of the sponsorship with with tennis or with China or with the Olympics. We're going to stick with it. And we're going to yeah. continue to be there." Chen Yanli. I, I, again, I think uh, if for. Um, all kinds of acquisitions, we need to firstly do the fact checking. You know, in China, since uh, 1978, we, made, we have made uh, reforms, economic uh, reforms. And it's now each family you know, in a village which is in charge of their, uh, its, its own fields, which means in Xinjiang, it works like that. How can we have first work in one's own fields? And what's more, we use many machines um, in Xinjiang, and especially uh, in the north of Xinjiang. I have seen and read many reports. And again, I just want to remind people that you need to, need to check the facts and double check the facts before acquiring somebody. Uh, it doesn't yeah, seem like logical I'd like to me. butt in here. Yeah. The thing, like it's, it's good to ask for us and for journalists and for us to check the facts, but yeah. uh, the conditions that journalists that aren't from state media Things many, many, in China are extremely complicated, right. and the, uh, every year the yeah, Foreign Correspondents Club of yeah. China releases a report saying that their work is impeded when they try to go in Xinjiang and try and investigate on okay. these mad, on these accusations and, of forced labor, uh, etc. There's always going to be that barrier where we you ask us to check the facts, but in effect we can't. I think it's the and can, sorry. Can I just come in as well? I, I've not yeah. accused anybody of anything. Just to be clear, I've not accused anybody of anything. Adidas made a decision based upon what he, it believed it should do to ensure that it business, its business remains strong and robust. So you know, if, you, if you're going to talk about Xinjiang, talk to Adidas about why they made their decision. Yeah, this, yeah the, for them, it's a question of watching the bottom line. And I just, just to, mm. to interject on that point, mm. human rights advocates in the Netherlands this week filing a criminal complaint against Patagonia, Nike, CNA, and State of the Art, those brands accused of profiting from forced labor uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, and this follows similar suits in France and Germany. So there's pressure on these companies from uh, consumers in the West. And there's pressure as well from uh, Beijing. Let's hear the reaction at the daily briefing at the foreign ministry. Certain Western politicians, especially in the US, have been playing up the so-called forced labor in Xinjiang. But they're in essence engaging in political manipulation under the guise of human rights to interfere in China's internal affairs and to contain and suppress the development of China, especially of the Xinjiang province. Their behaviors are immoral and despicable. Immoral and despicable, uh, is, is, is that, that's, that's strong language. I, I think, you know, uh, I have observed really much misunderstanding between both parties. Maybe you can try to put your place, uh, I mean, of China, I don't defend or, or the you know, uh, or, or the wording from the others. But if you are China and you face all the time the acquisitions, and I have observed there are many acquisitions which are not really based on the on the fact checking. Example with with Pan Shui. Because because I'm sorry, I'm yeah. going to interrupt here. Because what we heard in that statement yeah. was um, pressure from one state on another. But what we're okay. talking about here is. The pressure isn't just state-sponsored. It's not top-down here. 
This is coming from consumers. It's coming from uh, tennis stars. It's it's coming from the from That's, various sectors that the, okay. the pressures and the pressures, by the way, not just on China, but okay. also on these on the companies okay, okay. that do business there. I have read many reports, and I can say uh, you can see see easily if you do more research. There are many organizations, even human rights or some other organizations, which are financed by the USA, and the USA announced several months ago the, the strategic competition of 2021 to announce that they will finance, you know, the, the, the campaigns uh, to fight against China uh, starting from next year, in, uh, then in the, in, you know, for several years. And many people don't have the time, maybe don't have the, you know, the, 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 the com um, abilities to check by themselves. So I, I'm not defending, I mean, any uh, decision, but I just want to highlight that yeah, yeah, no, we that, need that's to seemed, that's double check point. the fact and we need to find a better way to communicate Charles with Pellegrin, that, each other. That, that perception yeah. that Chunyan Lee is talking about, that, uh, that uh, there is this sort of competition and it's adversarial on the part of the West. I think there's definitely uh, the... the, the the debate and the discussion is sort of getting ahead of itself and, and things are being inflamed. I mean, it's impossible. It's the truth is nowadays for someone like Joe Biden, um, any sort of gesture that seems uh, towards dialogue with China, towards sort of building bridges will be criticized in his domestic pol politics that are extremely anti-Chinese. And we've seen uh, public opinion about China in the developed world. The developing world is is something else, be extremely low. And so there is, um, there's this negative uh, starting point to the discussion where, in general, if you're in the developed world, if you're in Europe, if you're in uh, North America... Okay, so here's, the, here's yeah. the controversy, because that's on the West side. Yeah. And China's response has been, especially with the COVID pandemic, lock it down, keep out most uh, international travelers, and uh, be more self-reliant uh, uh, domestically. So... Hosting the Winter Olympics, it's the Winter Olympics is something where you're displaying your country to the rest of the world. So, yeah, is there a contradiction there? There is, and I think initially this was, but this is a domestic uh, endeavor. This is uh, China and Xi Jinping specifically wanting Beijing to be the first city to host both the summer and the Winter Olympics. And this is a this is about uh, setting some sort of marker in history to show China's rise as a superpower, to show another marker in its rise as an economic power. Uh, and this was all supposed to be about this narrative about, about China sort of ascending uh, in the world, but the narrative's uh, changing uh, a little bit now. And there is this paradox where indeed um, this uh, event is supposed to show this openness to the world, but no foreign travelers and no foreign uh, uh, spectators will be allowed to go because of the pandemic. Pandemic. Uh, and same as same in fairness, same, same as, as in Tokyo, Tokyo. Absolutely, yeah. but also just in general, uh, China keeps going on about how it's open uh, to the world. But you look at the latest census data: uh, the, the foreigner population in Beijing was sixty thousand people out of a city of over twenty million people. As a point of comparison, Paris has two million foreigners. Uh, the Paris region two million for foreigners for 11 million people. It shows completely different models. And really, uh, China is not that open to the world in spite of its words. You so need I'm to look at different uh, indicators, the amount of the foreign investment in China uh, is a big amount, for example, and a number of the foreign companies in China. Also, uh, a recent report of uh, the USA uh, Chamber uh, in Shanghai, it's not only the number of the foreign people in China. It, it, it's true that we but currently we have the feeling that China is closing its door. It's due to the pandemic. It's very difficult to travel. I, it was happening but before it's, that. It's, it, no, before that, if you look at the data, because I have checked all the data, the, the investment, number of, of uh, companies, and the feedback of the American companies. Uh, yeah, the, the, example, sum, the sums oh. of money. But <laughs> Simon Chadwick, just because uh, we're running out of time here, uh, it looks like a boycott for now is off the table. A, a, a major boycott like we saw at the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. That that doesn't seem likely at this point in time. But what is the nightmare scenario? Is it, for instance, seeing protests on the, the medal podiums during the Games? Uh, well, what was interesting about the, the, the Pong story is whilst everybody was talking about Pong, what, what very few people were doing was to talk about the other big Olympic story that week, um, which was Joe Biden and his administration briefing that there might be a diplomatic boycott. Uh, a diplomatic boycott 
fall some way short of an athletic boycott in the sense that you don't send government officials. And very often what and people happens... people don't care like, once the games have begun. They're just... just yeah, to... yeah, well, I guess, you know, it, it's nice to see your prime minister or, you know, your foreign your foreign minister there at the Olympics. But if you don't see them, then, hey, who cares? So that, so that would be a... But it's, it, it's got huge symbolism i think in terms of you know, signaling to uh, to the host nation that you're you're unhappy with them that you're dis- dissatisfied that you are you don't want to be seen to condone what what they're involved in so you know it could well still be that we get a diplomatic boycott because that that's what seems to be being briefed in in washington dc right now Obviously, that could escalate. Very, very often, there are cultural programs at Olympic Games. So, you know, typically, uh, uh, each country has a what's called a house. Um, so, France, there'll be France House, and uh, France House, France House would normally um, market products and market brand France and you know, uh, engage people with French culture. It could well be that that doesn't happen, and then obviously we get towards an athletic boycott, which, which I think is um, at the moment is still some way off. However. The fact that we keep see, seeing Thomas Bach uh, cropping up in in video recordings and photographs saying, "Don't worry, everything's okay." I think he is he's really trying to head this one off as early as he can because he does realize that if this begins to escalate, it's out of his control. There's nothing he can do. So this quiet diplomacy that he talks about is really him on behalf of the IOC, as I say, making sure that the Winter Olympics doesn't go the same way as the Summer Olympics. And looking forward, as we've said, keep in mind, we've talked about Paris 2024, but LA 2028, because I think if if the United States was to boycott China now, China would remember and 2028. You know, so we're talking about maybe the next decade of the Olympics being disrupted by a potential boycott now. All right. Two, two months and two days to go before the, the uh, opening ceremonies. Uh, Simon Chadwick, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, from Coventry. I want to thank uh, Chun Yan Lee, Charles Pelgrin. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.